So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start a new project. So, let's uh, sig signify a hosting today. I've already got that. Um, okay, so I'm going to start a new project here, and Fury is a command that runs on the command line. If I type Fury um, and press Tab, we get a list of things we can do. But to begin with, I'm just going to initialize a new repository. Now, in the background, uh, it's waiting for my Git password so that it can sign my commits. I got it wrong. There we are. So I initialized a new workspace. Workspace is uh, essentially just a directory in which you will do some programming. And it is a Git repository. And if I have a look in that directory, we can see there is now a new file. Uh, so I've initialized this as a Fury workspace. I hope you're all ready to shout out the questions whenever I... Yeah, go for it. Is, is the name Fury? Um, <laughs> is the name because of your obvious seething rage for everything? Yes. Or is it that <laughs> yes. the name was inspired by SBT? <laughs> <laughs> How many so is anyone here not using SBT? I, I assume most people no, use. I don't, I use Gradle. But... Use Gradle, okay. Do you love Gradle? Not oh, really. Okay. So <laughs> um, build tools in general. They don't get a lot of love. So you might ask what I'm doing to myself here. Um, I, 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 I hope that Fury will be a build tool that people actually like. Um, it, it's, uh, it's proving to be challenging, but I, I'm pleased with how things are going so far. So I'll, I'll keep on demonstrating, but yeah, any more questions, please just uh, yell. I don't, I don't, so don't, don't put your hand up and wait for me to notice you. Sorry? If you can zoom. Um, that is huge already, apparently. Um, I can't, I can't easily go bigger than that, I'm afraid. Um, and also, when I when I start displaying more information, it will need the full width. Um, yeah, sorry. So I've got a workspace, and what I can do is I can list some projects, but it's an empty workspace. There's no projects, so maybe we should add one. So. No part just using tab completion to complete all the commands as I go. And I've got a, a few options here to specify the, the project. All I need really is a name. So um, this is my, my signify workspace. And if you, are, if you are signify, you probably want to, you're, you're writing some, some code. Signify probably needs an HR database. Yeah? So let's just call it HRDB. So that's added the project, and if I if I uh, produce the list of projects there, we've got a got a new project. There's a little arrow pointing to it, telling us it's the current project. So that will become relevant when I start making modifications. And you'll notice that all of the commands execute instantaneously, more or less. There's no like compilation and running and then waiting to get the results back. What they're doing, what those commands typically do is to operate on a file, which is data. The build and the workspace are all being represented by pure data. What that means is, probably, there's two sides to that. With SBT, you, you, you probably know that you actually write code to describe the build. And then you compile the code, and then you run the, run, run the code, and at that point, SBT knows uh, a graph of what it's going to do. And it's slow. This is one reason why it's slow. You're using a Turing complete language to describe something that will probably, in most cases, be just a static graph description, where each node in the graph is some compilation that has to run, some invocation of the, the Scala compiler. And the input suite to those nodes in the graph are not really that complicated. There's a class path, there's some source files, there's a choice of compiler, and there's some compiler parameters. I don't think I've forgotten anything else. And that it will produce class files. And those class files will feed into the class path of the next module that you compile. 
So realizing that in most cases, we are dealing with something that's quite simple, allows me to use data to represent the majority of, of builds, I hope. It remains to be seen, but it's looking, looking quite good so far. So this is why I can be fast with all the commands. I can make the changes and I can, um, uh, every time I make a change, it's rewriting that file. Now you may notice if you're looking carefully that there is a little asterisk that's appeared after, after this command here. That's because the file is in a Git repository and I've changed it. So I've got, uh, so it's, it's just an ordinary Git repository with one file in it, which I'm modifying. So you can use all the Git commands you've got to uh, stash or change branches if you really want to. Um, it, it, it's very transparent that that's what's happening. And uh, this, this is the file we work with. I'll just show you the file. The file is designed for, um, this is a very simple one because it's, because it's empty, it'll get bigger and bigger, but it's designed to be human readable, in particular readable as diffs. So if you have a diff that is some modification to this, it's designed to be, um, if I need to do a git, git diff, um, it's, it's meant to be readable what the differences are. Uh, but primarily only computer writing. You can make changes, you can, re you can guess at what, uh, what it's meant to do, but um, it, it, it's your fault if you break it. I mean, it you, you, you will be told if, uh, if you try to do that. So that's, that's just telling you to be a little bit clear about, clearer about what is going on behind the scenes, but from our point of view, what we're going to do is we're going to run a series of commands to modify that file to generate and develop a build. So I mentioned projects. Projects correspond broadly to projects in SBT, or your, um, uh, what, what might be distributed as a, as a single repository uh, on, on GitHub. Modules are the units of compilation that uh, get put into a graph and they get compiled in a, in a particular order. Uh, and they correspond to sub-modules in SBT. So we need some modules in order to do anything useful. So that's a list of the, the modules. And again, we get tab completion with help. And that's a really big thing for usability, I think. When you're, I mean, I, I, I know the user interface for Fury, but if you're learning it for the first time, you don't know what's there. So discoverability through tab completion is something which I think is very important for, uh, for, for using this. So I'm going to add a module, and let's just call it, uh, let me see a few of the options there. Cool. Um, you, can, you can specify the type. Uh, it would be a library by default, but why not specify it as well? So list of modules again, we've now got uh, we've got a module there. Okay, so we're, we're starting to get somewhere. Uh, let's actually create some source. Yeah. Have you written the command line interface itself or is it a library to use? I've written it myself. Okay. Uh, I've written it as a library that will um, that doesn't have anything to do with Fury. So once I'm happy with everything, that will be published <coughs> independently and you can use that. Okay. Um, just as, a, as an aside, um, Fury itself is around 2,500 lines of code. It's not big. It has um, half a dozen, no, probably a dozen libraries that it depends on. Uh, generally, all things I've written, um, which are themselves all very small. So it's, I've gone for very, very modular, uh, tiny, tiny projects. Um, some projects maybe you know anyway, like Magnolia and Contextual, which I've put some effort into. Uh, promoting others are things which I think will be useful to people, but uh, aren't, aren't really worth the conference talk, so I don't talk about them too much. But um, yeah, there's, there's a few projects involved, and everything is as small and uh, modular as possible. So, um, you can see there's a, there's, a, there's a few headings here which maybe give you some indication as to how uh, some of the things you might do with these. So, uh, with the script here. What I'm going to do is create some source. That's meant to say that. Uh, and let's just let's just write a quick hello world program here. Um, any 
mistakes there. It doesn't matter anyway because we'll see the compiler errors if there are. Okay. So, uh, I've added the source, but Fury still doesn't know that that source is relevant at all to build. So I need to add the source to the module that I wanted to build. And we've got this module core. It's currently selected because it's that, there's the arrow there. So I'm going to say um, Fury module source add. And I get tab completion. It knows that that folder is there. It knows that it contains a Scala source file. And it will pick up any, any folders that contain Scala sources. And it will offer them as tab completion. We only had one, so I didn't even have to type it. So if I hit that, and I'm almost ready to compile, but there's one thing missing, which is quite important, which is a compiler. So I can't, I can't do the compilation yet. Uh, let me just show you the, we, we, we've now got this local source. So I need to add a compiler. Now, in order to add a compiler, I need to explain a little bit more about how things work. Sorry, but local, does it mean that it's going to be more? Oh, sorry, oh, say, say again. Uh, it's saying local. Yes, it's it going to be more? Uh, yes, it, it can. I will show you that shortly. So we, we can actually depend on sources that are um, pulled from remote, but uh, lo lo local means in the same, in the same form. So the local uh, repository is always available to you in any workspace. It is the workspace, in a sense. And you can use Git to commit files to the same workspace that the build is defined in. Or you can depend on files in a remote repository. So let's, let's do that, because I'm actually not going to depend on source files. I'm going to depend on another workspace. Because I have a Scala compiler set up, published, on my GitHub account that I can now depend on. Now, generally, Fury depends on sources rather than binaries. For the compiler, it's it, too much work for me to get Scala to compile from source. Maybe I can do it one day, but right now, it's just easier to compile from binaries. Um, but in order to depend on that, I need to tell my current workspace uh, to basically import another workspace, a published workspace, which would then make all of those projects available to me to depend on, uh, including specifically the compiler. So the way I'm going to do that is with schema. Now, I will explain schemas a little bit more later, but for now, we're only going to have one schema, so you don't need to think about it, uh, it too much. Um, and I'm going to add a new repository. So I can I can do Fury schema repo add and dash r. Now I can use shorthand. There's a, there's a nice convenient shorthand for GitHub, also Bitbuckets and uh, GitLab, so GH, BB, or GL. Uh, and I can just write uh, base there. So I've now added a base repository, uh, added the base repository from GitHub to this workspace. Now, unfortunately, I haven't, I haven't implemented the features that make that visible to you, but I will demonstrate that it works by um, setting the compiler. I'm going to update the module to set the compiler to uh, Scala slash compiler, which has now become available to me because I've, oh, it hasn't, I haven't quite done that right yet. I need to do one more thing. I've imported the repository. I need, I, I depend on the repository. Let me show you. Show you that. So this is a list of the two repositories I have available. There's the local one, and then there's the there's the remote one. You can see it's got the uh, got the commit. These have been cloned in the background. So the command returned immediately, but it uh, asynchronously went and downloaded that repository. So that's now uh, now available to me, and I can import. Uh, I haven't got tab completion working on this yet, but I can import base default. So this is going to import the appropriate schema, the schema that's called default, from the repository here that's called base. By the way, you'll notice that things are all very colorful. 
So if all of the error messages, all of the information messages, use a consistent color scheme for different types of entity. So I'm doing everything I can to try to indicate that when you read some identifier, it might be a project, it might be a module, it might be a schema, the color will hopefully, uh, hopefully give some indication as to which one of those things it is. And you'll get used to the, uh, the colors that are used for different things. So I've imported, I actually missed that. So I've, I've imported uh, from that repository. So I, first of all, I depend on the source repository. Then I import the workspace uh, into my into my current workspace. And now I can add the Scala compiler. So if I've done everything correctly, we've got these modules here. We've got a, a compiler. So project in green, module in blue. Uh, we haven't set any parameters. These are the sources that will be compiled. We've got no dependencies. And if I just run Fury like this, that compiled. I mean, it was only Hello World, so it was instantaneous, more or less. I use Bloop, which is a project developed by the Scala Center, to do the actual compilation. Now, what Bloop does is it keeps a hot Scala compiler, several hot Scala compilers running in the background, so that when you send it work, the compiler has already been optimized by Hotspot, it's fast. So if you thought that was fast, that's mainly because of Bloop. So that's, that's compilation done. And if I, uh, what I can do is I can open, just demonstrate file watching for you. Um, can you. So I've got two windows open here and if I just edit the edit the source file here. Uh, sorry, can you use the font on the other one? Sorry. Yeah, I, I was thinking you didn't actually need to see the contents that I was changing, but uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to break this in a random way. And if I hit save, it recompiles and underneath there you get the error. And so I'm gonna save now and that was compilation. So that was pretty quick. I mean, trivial, trivial code, but uh, that's fast because of Bloop, primarily. So that, that, is, that is compilation for probably the easiest project you'll, you'll ever see. OK. Um, so we can do more complicated things. I'm just going to show you um, something I was working on before. Um, I tried converting some of the type level projects to, to use Fury. And I can list the projects there. So we've got uh, Cats, Kind Project, Machinist, Macro Compact, Shapeless, and Simulacrum. And um, most of these are actually very trivial. Cats, Cats is a bit more complicated, but Cats doesn't work yet. So I mean, I'm still in the process of working out all the modules that, uh, that I need to convert and dependencies between them. This is a list of the modules in CATS. So I worked that out just by trying to understand the SPT build. Incidentally, it's kind of hard to read an SPT build and understand what's, what's in there, what it does. Um, the, CATS, the CATS build, I think, is over, I can't 1,000 or 2,000 lines of code, which seems a bit ridiculous, um, given there are only there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. there's eight modules in there. Um, and at least 2,000 lines to define a variety of things around that. Now, I'm, I'm not going to do everything that that, uh, that build does. The build creates a microsite and does other things. I'm never going to provide that sort of functionality with Fury. If you, if you want to do those things, then my answer is to use other tools and use something like Make or Shell Script to compose them. Make will give you the flexibility to do anything you want. Fury will give you only the flexibility to define, build graphs, and compile. So I've very much taken on a more constrained task. I'm, I'm, I'm providing a smaller set of functionality, I hope better, and doing it well, rather than trying to do all things for all kinds of users in all kinds of flexible situations. And what that buys me is the ability to just go to this project and uh, just describe a build 
very, very quickly like that. I can, I can run this describe command, and it shows me all of the, all of the links between all of the projects, that, uh, all of the modules that, uh, that will be run when, when the build runs. Now, I think if I, um, I, I told you this, this wasn't working correctly, but uh, if, I, if I try and build it, uh, it will, this is a bit slow, but for some reason I don't know yet, but it, uh, I don't think it needs to be, so I can fix that. Oh, it's not meant to be this slow, though. <laughs> oh, I think it's, I think it's actually not doing anything because um, the files haven't changed. I'm just going to delete all of the, uh, I'm going to force it to clean, I haven't got a clean file yet, but if I just, if I just delete everything. That's, that's the hacky, the sort of hacky thing you can do if you want to, you just delete, delete stuff. And if I try and run this again, maybe it'll work. Maybe I've, maybe I've broken it before the tour. I'm giving it three seconds. I think I've done something to break it. So, pretend that works. <laughs> Uh, I'll, let, let, me, let me show you that. That looks, that looks nice and cool and pretty. So, um, yeah, for a more complicated thing, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've done something in the last day that's, that's made that stop working. But uh, you'll, you'll see probably a few, a few bugs and issues in, in the rest of the talk. Uh, how am I doing for time, by the way? Am I sort of halfway? So, anyway, when do you think it will be like first release ready? Or? When will it be ready? Yeah, first release. First release. Um, my, my intention is to have a private beta first. So my, my intention is that uh, I can share it with maybe about 10 people, like a number of people I can deal with the feedback from. <laughs> what I don't want to do, what I don't want to do is release it to the whole world and have people writing builds, distributing builds, and then discovering something's broken. My, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm being closed in, in the way I'm doing development, uh, which is a little bit sort of contrary to open source philosophy. But I do, pragmatically, I need to uh, not produce something that is uh, a disappointment when people first use it. I can disappoint 10 people and it doesn't matter. Um, and if I pick the right 10 people, they won't be disappointed anyway. They'll just give me good feedback and then I'll fix the things that, that aren't working as they'd like them. Um, and then maybe I'll increase it to more people, and then as long as I'm carrying on coping with the feedback and the issues I'm getting, uh, my hope is that in a couple of months, give or take a month, um, we're probably between one and a half and three months, uh, I will have a first release. Um, and then pr private beta maybe two weeks from now. Uh, so there's, there's a few sort of fundamental issues I need to fix first, like building. <laughs> uh, I, I need to be able to represent things like the... I, just, I think, uh, let, me, let me show you something else. Uh, I'm, I'm going I'm to give this build one last try. What I need to do is select the right module. So I think um, core is the one we're interested in. It was previously pointing at this one. I think that was maybe where the problem was. Um, Hopefully it won't let me down this time. Yeah, there we go. So it compiles in parallel. And this is Bloop producing this output. So Bloop is compiling all those things. And we'll get a load of compilers when it gets on to compile core. So this is compiling all of these projects here. It's, it's compiling Macro Paradise from source. So that, that, that's as far as I've got with doing the CATS conversion. I don't know why these errors are occurring. Um, some, something I've set up incorrectly but it's just a matter of me looking more closely at the SPT build and working out what's being done differently there and trying to replicate it. Uh, if I go back up here, it builds Macro Paradise. So normally that's distributed as a binary. We're building it from source. It's using Kind Projector, which is the compiler plugin. I can, uh, 
Uh, let me show you the modules, um, because this, this is a, a slightly bigger project. Ooh, that's, uh, that's a bit too big. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll set the font size to a reasonable, reasonable size later. So um, this, this is a grid. It shows the dependencies <coughs> for different things. It shows uh, whether they're libraries. Some of them will be compiler plugins. Some of them will be applications. Uh, they all use the same compiler. Um, now, one thing, one thing I could do, say I had a choice of different compilers, and I had a um, this, 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 won't, this won't work, but I can demonstrate how you might make a, a change globally. Uh, I've just listed the list of the projects there, and you get this nice colourful table, but that's not very good for shell scripting. So today I have a feature where I can just get a list of items like that. So I can now write, actually, you can't see this, can you? Uh, let me go back to what my computer calls huge. So if, if I list with the, the, uh, the raw flag, then we get output, which we can then use in shell scripting. So I can say for um, n in theory module list raw, do uh, fury module update. Um, now I can specify the module as dash uh, as dollar m, and then I can set the compiler to something else, Scala, Scala JS slash compiler. Now, in future versions, this won't work because it won't be able to find that compiler. But in in this version, it will permit it, and then it just won't work. But Again, that uh, updates instantaneously, and if we, if we list the projects, you can see they're now pointing to Scala.js, and we update all of them one by one. So I very much want this to be composed with other things on the, on the command line. Um, the interfaces for interoperating with, with Fury are not going to be uh, Scala interfaces. They will be uh, it will be a command line application that, that you can use as you might compose shells, which use Git or, or other, other tools. I'm, the, other, the other decision I made, partly to make my life easier, but also for very good reasons, is I don't want to have any kind of plugin interface. And I know that other build tools like Mill do have a plugin interface. The problem with plugins is that they, by their very nature, you want them to be able to do all sorts of functionality that you haven't thought up at the time you write it. You want them to have a lot of flexibility to, to change all sorts of things. But that essentially means that any interface I provide, any Scala interface, API I provide, would need to be very stable. That stops me being able to modify it unless I make it incredibly fragile. It stops, uh, it makes it very hard for plugin authors to have an API they can depend on. And essentially, what I do instead of allowing those plugins to do anything in the world, I don't allow them at all, but I say you can get the information out of Fury using command line tools, you can, you can pull out the information you need, and you can use something like Make and other command line tools. So to, to, to those additional changes that you want. So very conscious decision not to have it. And that's, that's one half of the answer. The other half of the answer of plugins is if there is something which is useful functionality, which would be beneficial to all users of Fury, uh, just as an example, ScalaFix. So ScalaFix is a tool for modifying source code uh, automatically. That, I think, has a lot of utility for the whole Scala ecosystem. My plugin interface is a PR to Fury. If you want to have, if someone wants to have uh, Scala fix support, and if I don't provide it myself, somebody else can create a pull request, 
they can add it, and then if it's going to be useful for everyone, and if the maintenance overhead for Fury is not too huge, then that becomes a native part of the build tool. So those are my two answers to um, plugins and doing arbitrary things that, uh, that the SBT would do with plugins that I, um, I, I'm going to support in different ways that hopefully learn the lessons of, I mean, I don't know if anybody here went through the pain of upgrading from uh, SBT 0.13 to 1.0, but I as I understand it, I, I, didn't, I didn't upgrade anything. People, people helped me out and uh, upgraded my projects for me. But all of the plugins broke, I think, because of that fragile API. So I'm, I'm going to avoid that. Actually. So a couple more things um, I'll go through. But by the way, shout out questions if, um, if anyone has any. Anything like, yeah? So I heard that the command itself is it just really fast. Is it kind of written in Scala itself? It's written in Scala, yeah. Okay. And it uses nail gun. So Fury runs as a server. Um, the command that you run to the command line talks to nail gun, sends the command basically. And the server is already running on a port and it returns some output. Um, that's how it's able to run as fast as it does. Uh, people ask me if, it, if I could have used Scala native. And yes, I probably could have done, but um, it was easier to use nail gun basically right now. So that, that, that's that's why I did. Um, I'm, I'm still I'm, I'm just checking through my uh, my list of things I wanted to talk about. But sh uh, shout out. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, so you said if you want to extend Fury, it's better to do it like by other like me or something. So, use case, for example, building Docker images out of the code. Yeah. Uh, if I'm going to do this outside, like a shell script or something, mm -hmm. uh, like SBT or MongoDB, or any, is it possible? Uh, if if you would allow people to write plugins or something, uh, we would have the benefit of. Uh, if the code didn't change, then we need to rebuild the Docker image. I think we're going to lose this. So you've got, to, you've got to make a file like that. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, but... Yeah. Um, you could rely on make to notice when files change. Uh, I, guess, I guess you'd want something like... Um, and that, that would go... That would go there, and that would depend on compile. And you would then, so, so I haven't implemented this, but um, all of the compiles I showed you with Fury, they didn't actually give you the class files. The class files are hidden away somewhere where you don't, where you don't see them. Because most of the time when you're doing a compilation, you want one of two things. You want to know it's a success, or you want to know what the errors are. And then you do a bit more development work. It's only occasionally you actually want to get access to the binary. So. Um, you can, the command you would run is going to be something, it's not not implemented, but something like uh, save dash file uh, dash, dash, dash f um, library.jar. So you actually save the, the, the compiled version out as a jar file to some location on your disk. And then I guess this, uh, this would be lib.jar. Make knows whether lib has, lib.jar has changed. Uh, before running Docker build. So, I don't know how familiar people are with Make, but Make's been around for 40 years. And um, the reason is that it's simple enough to understand just by reading it. It has its quirks, sure, but you don't need to understand a very complicated model in order to understand Make. So I, I'm, I'm kind of very pro Make as a simple tool that has survived the test of time. And I, I very much see Fury as something that could um, uh, could be composed with, with Make. Um, the other thing is that most of the most of the sort of interesting plugins that SPT has are either either operate entirely before compilation 
or entirely after. So they're, maybe they're things like source code formatting, or they're things like Docker, building Docker images. And that, you, you don't need to slot things in the middle. You don't need to do random tasks that, that fit in between two modules, most of the time. I'm sure people can come up with examples, but, but generally speaking, um, you're, you're, you're doing things first, then you run the compilation, then you do some packaging afterwards, so you Scala dog or something like that. So that, that kind of works, works quite well um, with, with this model. You can always run multiple compiles on different projects in your make file with, with Fury. Uh, compile one, do some random stuff, like maybe you need to rewrite the jar file in some magic way, then, then, then do something else. Uh, right. I was going to show you one, I was going to do a very quick example of the sort of things I was doing to try to convert a project like, like CAS. So I'm going to start. Um, I will start a new CAX project. I need to start my password in again. Let's keep this signing everything. There we are. Oh, by the way, I've got a room full of people who know about computers. Does anyone know why I get this? Nobody knows. Okay. Um, if, if, you, if you work it out, tell me. Because it's an annoying little bug with. Um, uh, it just gets out, but occasionally. Uh, I'll, I'll work it out at some point, but uh, you'll know tell me. Uh, so, I'm going to add a new project. I'm going to call it CATS. I'm going to add a new module called uh, Kernel. I'm doing this from my memory of having done it before with, um, with the previous conversion. So those are my modules. What I need to do is set up a dependency between them. So I want uh, core to depend on kernel. Um, so I can set the dependencies. I can add a dependency on. I get tab completion. I want. Uh, so my current one is core. I want to depend on kernel. There's the list. Um, <coughs> now I need a repository. I need the catch repository. So I'm going to add. Uh, repository um, GitHub type level cats. There is cats. We've got a very fast internet connection here because it's already. Uh, so there, there is. Oh no, it's, no, it hasn't uh, hasn't cloned yet because we don't have the commit hash. But if I run it again, that's now downloaded in the background asynchronously. Um, now we need to add the source code. So. In my, in my modules here, I've got the source option. And I can add a source with dash s. Now, if I press tab here, it also completes to cats, which is the name of the repository, the one I just uh, cloned here. If I press tab again, this is a list of all of the folders that contain any Scala files. So I'm setting this up for core, and I think something like that is probably going to work. Probably that. So there's my there's my source. Um, and I also do the same thing for a different module. So I can use dash n. <coughs> oh, I can't use dash n. I, I will. Um, that's that's a small bug, but I'm going to select kernel and again we're going to use tab completion just to give us take us straight to the place in that repository where the source has come from. Uh, what else do I need to do? I need to, uh, maybe we need some parameters. Let's, um, kernel probably contains some macros. So let's, um, let's add a parameter. And maybe it needs X future. So we've now got, it doesn't actually show all the parameters until it's only happening, there are, and you can, you, can, uh, you, can, you can view them like that if you want. So al although I'm, I'm sort of um, just going through the motions because I'm not going to run this because it doesn't have some of the other dependencies, hopefully you can see how easy it is to 
select the sources, to define the tasks that, that, that make up the build. And uh, I know cats, cats is probably a difficult thing to, to start with, but um, it, it, it's quite possible, as, as you saw uh, up here, to have a build that looks like this, that has all of these uh, dependencies, and that they're all defined just from a, a series of commands I run. And when we actually try and run them, it will compile Macro Paradise, it will compile Cat's Kernel, it will compile Macro Compact, Machinist, Kind Projector, and uh, at, the, at the end of it, if it all worked, which it doesn't yet, then we would have a successfully compiled Cat's which we'd want to share with people, I think. You'd want, having done all that work, you'd want to make that available to other people to use. So publishing is something that I think is very important. Now, at the moment, we have a system that's based all around Maven Central. Everybody, certainly in the open source world, depends heavily on Maven Central for um, sharing, sharing published, uh, or publishing artifacts. Most projects, most open source projects will publish a version of Scala 2.12, a version of Scala 2.11, Scala, Scala JS version, maybe even a Scala native version, uh, maybe a different Scala JS version. Uh, typically, there's sort of seven, seven, seven common thing, co common um, target platforms that people will publish for. All because we're using binaries, and those binaries have to link to different other binaries. We don't have this problem with sources. Sources, are, sources may be compiled, maybe they don't compile, but um, the compiler will actually check them. And we don't have to rely on luck to some degree that all of those binaries which are distributed on Maven Central that we, we sort of pull together from different places with some combination of POM files or POM definitions, we don't have to rely on the luck that they will all leak successfully at runtime. If we've compiled them all, and they don't go anywhere, they don't get mixed up between being compiled and being run. As long as we trust the compiler to, link, to, to compile things correctly, they will not have linkage errors. They won't have class not found, they won't have no such method errors. So for this reason, sources are very much a nicer solution. We don't have to publish things multiple times. We don't have to have multiplicative um, publish, uh, um, publish artifacts. We just have the source once. Is it time or is it five minutes? Uh, I, I will. <laughs> so let, let me just show you how easy it is to publish something. You type Fury Workspace Publish, and I need to give it a tag. A tag is just a GitHub. Uh, actually, one thing I need to do is let me let me just publish this to GitHub. Uh, I'm going to use the hub. Uh, Command, which, if you don't know Hub, it's basically GitHub from the command line with application website. So I'm going to create uh, cats, for example, that has gone off to GitHub. It's doing some stuff. Great. We've now got a repository that has a remote. And I'm going to say Fury Workspace Publish. Uh, you need a GPG key because I believe that there's an element of trust in distributing software, which uh, I won't talk about, but I'll sign it with GPT and it's got uh, all of my keys, my private keys there, and give a tag, V1.0, um, hit enter, and that is published. So that was a lot easier and a lot faster. You can now share that link on um, Twitter, and anyone can then pull that repository in and import that workspace, and we don't have to wait days or months for software to become available. Anyway, I, I am. Uh, out of time, so I will. Uh, have we got time for some questions? Yeah, of yeah, yeah. Shout, shout out questions, or maybe this time, yeah, question there. You mentioned Blue, which was like, yeah, compiler. is that running on a local machine? That, that is running as a server on my local machine. Um, I think the Blue developers have plans to provide remote Blue instances, and there's all kinds of possibilities when we've got sort of very wide parallelism that you can distribute the work to more than one machine. and Maybe if, if you do have that level of parallelism for very big projects, then you could get faster compiles. 
um, through distribution. Um, I'll just take this opportunity to mention that um, source compiling everything from source can potentially be quite slow. Um, if you've got big, a big dependency tree, it's, it's not going to make things faster if you've got to wait for everything to compile. So I anticipate it would be possible to um, uh, hash and uh, cache compiled, uh, compiled versions and store them on some sort of uh, either a central, probably central to a, um, a, a company, uh, a, a, a hash storage device that, that Fury could check first, is this hashed version available? If so, just download it rather than compiling. If not, recompile and push the, uh, push the compiled version up there. Um, I talked about source dependencies. Binary dependencies are also supported with, with Maven, and it just uses Corsier to download them. Uh, any, anything else that you think I should have mentioned that I maybe haven't? Yeah, did you make a build file, a uh, human rebuild, but not the human uh, I, I don't trust humans. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't trust people. Well, I, the thing is, you, 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 can, you can edit it, but. Um, so I could have used JSON or something. Uh, I had a few annoyances with that. I, did, I didn't want to have a, a dependency on a large JSON library, so that the, the total size of Fury is pretty tiny. Um, and it was very easy. It was about 200 lines of code to write the, to write the code to uh, serialize and deserialize that format. And it's very fast, and it, it works pretty well. Uh, it uses Magnolia. Uh, serializing and deserializing from case classes. So I'm, I'm kind of happy with how it works without the need for a... So I, I chose 200 lines of code over a, a large dependency, basically. But I have one very tiny benefit, which is that when you do a diff with Git, and I anticipate people will look at these diffs, they will look at the lines that have changed. They'll see that one thing has been replaced by another or something's been removed. There won't be um, spurious lines because a comma has changed at the end. It's a really minor thing, but uh, that was one contributing factor. Uh, we do get nice diffs. One last question. So, quick question. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, at some in Australia, the moment you showed that you run some commands and then you showed some results on the screen, but some information wasn't in the data because you have this uh, server running in, in the ground and doing some, some stuff, yes? So yes. what, 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 what will happen, for example, from user experience? Let's say I done something, but it was like a very, you know, com it, 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 it takes time. Yeah? So it takes time. Or and I don't know, is it, is it actual my yeah, yeah. problem or it's, I just need to wait? Right, right. I need to wait. Or, or, or it failed, perhaps. Um, if, if you're cloning a GitHub repository, maybe you type it incorrectly and it's not there. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, I need to provide some better um, usability on that. Uh, I'm thinking that I won't have asynchronous mode on by default, so we'll be able to turn it on if you want to do things that way. But by default, when you say clone the repository, it will wait. It will give you feedback as well as to what's happening, uh, to tell you certainly what's happening. Um, and then if, if you are maybe in asynchronous mode, what I will do is um, maybe have a list of tasks that are ongoing. So I can, I can sort of list the, at least the active things at the moment we're downloading or this thing failed and then you can go and fix whatever it is and try again. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of a good question because as users you need to know, you, you need good feedback on what's happening and this is something that I complain about with SBT. You, you don't understand what's happening most of the time. Um, so I, I, I do certainly intend to, to, to make that experience better. Yeah. Are you just as excited now as when you started this? <laughs> I'm not as angry as I was when I started. <laughs> I, it's a, I, like, I like this question. I started because I, I was at um, North East Scala in Boston. And I, I had a 10 hour flight ahead of me. I was on my way home. And I planned to do a load of a load of work. I've got on the plane. No, no Wi-Fi, of course. And SBT was just crashing for reasons I didn't understand. And I spent half an hour tr 
trying to work out why. I, I, don't, I can't remember if it was trying to connect to the internet and I. And it, and it was fake, well, it was fake because I was on a plane, but. Um, for whatever reason, I was so angry with SBT, I thought, forget it, I'm finally going to write this build tool I've been thinking about for the last five years. I'm not, I'm not joking, I, I, I've been contemplating this for a long time, and it's only been like my own rational good sense that stopped me until now. But that flight, um, that flight sent me over the edge, and I, by the time I got back to the UK, I had made enough progress to convince myself that it was worth continuing. So I, I, had the, I had the design in my head, or a, a, an earlier iteration of the design in my head for a long time, years, because I, I've, I've never liked SBT. I've never liked the various choices it made on, on different things. Um, and I have been thinking about this. I, I chatted for a long time with Miles Sabin about it. He gave me the advice that, well, if you're going to fail, you might as well fail in an interesting way. And uh, which is what he, which is what he did with, what, what he set out to do with Shapeless, to fail in an interesting way. And what, what, a, what a great failure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so if, 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 I, if I end up like that, then, uh, then I'll be happy. Um, I should probably get off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.